Hello, and welcome to another edition of Storiophonic, a regular conversation series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. We'd like to ask you to take a minute to review or rate our podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on our website at storiophonic.com and on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Now let's meet the host of Storiophonic, Dan Kimpel, and today's special guest. Her range is immense. Engineer, producer, and mixer extraordinaire Leslie Ann Jones has been behind the board for everyone from Rosemary Clooney and Kronos Quartet to Carlos Santana and Allison Chains. As the director of music recording and scoring for Skywalker Sound, she tracks orchestral scores, mixes film and video elements for features, including such music-intensive cinematic landmarks as Apocalypse Now, Requiem for a Dream, and Happy Feet. I think you have to respect the people that you work with. I think that comes from me from growing up in the business and seeing the great talent that my parents both work with and, and knowing that you had to be a great trombonist because you might have to play Flight of the Bumblebee and be on a trapeze at the same time. You know, not everybody can do that. But I grew up respecting musicians, uh, so I, I think that that's uh, a lot of that. And I don't know if that's magic, but that's just how I do it. You know, I have uh, respect for the artists that I, I work with. I can't do what they're doing, which is why I do what I do. And so I, I try to never forget that. A multiple Grammy Award winner and inducted this year by NAM into the Tech Hall of Fame for her achievements, Leslie Ann Jones is an audio icon of the First Order. And she's with us now on Storiophonic. It's Grammy Week in Los Angeles. There is so much going on around that event. And one of the things that's going on around the event is Leslie Ann Jones is with us in the Storiophonic studio. It's good to have you. Thanks very much. Glad you know, to be here. You were on our wish list, and we envisioned flying to San Francisco, renting a car, uh, going up to Lucas Sound, and interviewing you there. But Life could be worse if you did, you know. That sounded like fun. Yeah. And some wine tasting <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> but what's good is that you're that you're here with us in this yeah. this this great week, and it's so it's such an exciting week and exciting time, and you know there's so much energy around the Grammys. I know you're going to be at the Grammy Awards. Are you going to be in the booth? No, I don't actually mix. Uh, although I have in the past mm -hmm. been one of the house sound mixers, I've never done the broadcast mix. Many of us have been involved with the Grammy organization for a long time, so. We have um, what we call audio advisors for all the facets of the sound for the award show. So I'm the audio advisor for House Sound. So I work with Michael Stewart and Ron Reeves and any of the artists' uh, representatives that come in. And uh, there's uh, somebody, uh, Glenn Lorbecki, who's one of our uh, past trustees, uh, does the music mix. He supervises that. You know, he's the audio advisor for that. And Ed Cherney is now the audio advisor for the broadcast. And so there's an academy person at each spot because, you know, our awards are about sound after all. And we want to make sure that um, the quality of the sound in the house and uh, going out to broadcast is as good as it uh, possibly can be. And um you know, we work with great people in every stage of that that do this for a living all the time. Great. And you've been on the other side of it, too. You've uh, you've been presented with Grammy Awards as well. Yes, yeah. I have. Yeah. yeah. yeah I know. That, that always makes for a bit of a stressful Grammy week for me, you know, because I have to excuse myself from the, what is, you know, the dress rehearsal and say, excuse me, I have to go and, you know, maybe get a Grammy Award, and, you know, but uh, the years like this where I'm not nominated or calmer. I 
Don't have to bring as many clothes, which is always nice. And <laughs> That's great. Well, they call it music's biggest night, and it certainly it is. is that. Yeah. And everything, I think for those of us that around, there, there are so many things that happen around the event. It's not just that event. It's like, you know, that's the center of it, but there are so many different things that go on, and uh, it's, it's a great celebration of music. And, yeah. you know, it reminds us again how important that is in all of our lives. And uh, talking about big nights, well, maybe a big day, I think you were down in Anaheim. I was. They were at Anaheim yes. at the uh, the Technical Excellence and yeah. Creativity Committee uh, gave you the groundbreaking award, the Tech Hall of Fame yeah. award. And uh, I was in Anaheim and actually didn't go to Disneyland, which was you know, <laughs> not many people can say that. <laughs> did you walk through the Nam Show itself? I did a little. It's really uh, funny because I wasn't on any panels, which also frees me up because then I can go see a lot of panels and. I uh, had some amazing experiences going to different people's workshops. You know, for those that haven't been to the NAMM show, it's gotten absolutely huge. And they've uh, kind of um, uh, embraced the pro-audio community in a way that's really wonderful. And I think that that started many years ago when uh, kind of Pro audio became prosumer audio. People were buying home recording equipment, and NAM kind of embraced that. There are all these uh, panels and workshops at the um, Anaheim Hilton, which is right across a walkway from the convention center. And then, of course, all the instruments and uh, music manufacturers and pro audio. And pro audio is now on a whole separate wing all by itself, which is also great because if you don't want to listen to people playing drums at, you know, 120 SPL, you can make your way to the audio booth and, you know, where it's a little more more quiet. Great. So I did finally make it to the show on the day of the awards and uh, spent a couple of hours there. You know, some great workshops. Um, Eddie Kramer on uh, Electric Lady Land and Vance Powell, also a whole workshop on... Um, Jeff Emmerich. Yeah. And it's pretty stunning. Were you a read the credits person? Because you grew up in the area of, oh, uh, yeah. of LP. Absolutely. You were read the credits. Yeah. You know, because I kind of grew up in the business. And then when I was playing myself, we had a lot of pretty famous studio session players playing on our records. Um, not that we ever got signed, but it certainly wasn't their fault. So, yeah, I was uh, a credit reader because I wanted to know who played on what. And I sort of knew what an engineer and a producer were did, but I always was very interested in that. Good. I'm definitely going to delve into that. So you, I understand that with your bands, you, you were working with some of the people from the Wrecking Crew, the very, mm-hmm. very yeah. famous session, yeah. LA, LA, legendary LA cast, yeah. you know, that's that's back in the day. But uh, for those listeners that don't know, um, you grew up in Beverly Hills, California. You I grew did. up from a entertainment family. Uh, your mother is a wonderful singer, um, Helen Greco born in Greco, uh, that we know from Tacoma, Washington. And your father was a legendary uh, Spike Jones. Yeah. Um, and it's been really fun in doing research. I was certainly more familiar with Spikes than I was your mom, but your mom's an amazing song stylist. Uh, yeah, great American songbook stuff, but songs mm-hmm. like Black Coffee, her version of that. I got to spend a lot of time with that through the magic of YouTube, of course. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It's great to revisit all that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and you know, Spike Jones... You know, in, into Fuhrer's face or things that I grew up with that people would just reference that then I would find out were actually songs that they were referencing. Mm-hmm. So um, were you aware of that, of their impact, especially Spike's impact at that time? Or I don't think so. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of weird because when you grow up with that, you just think that that's kind of what it is. And, and uh, I always kind of resented somewhat when I was growing up that – we didn't go to summer camp or we didn't go on family vacations because my parents were always working. But not every kid gets to go to Disneyland with an e-pass around their neck and they can go on any ride they want whenever they want. Um, so, you know, it, life's a, you know, a series of choices. And, you know, I think we made out okay. It wasn't really until I was an adult that I heard the straight version of a song that my father had done. And, you know, and when I hear it now, of course, I just 
immediately put in all the sound effects where they're supposed to go and in, in my head, you know. But the generation he was making his records for, of course, were very familiar with all those tunes. Those were the standards of the day that people were buying. But all I knew really were his versions with all the sound effects in and his invention of instruments was always very mm-hmm. interesting, including making an instrument out of a toilet. I believe that yes. was. Yes. <laughs> it was called a guitarlet for, you know, toilet. Oh, the so, gu- yeah, gotcha. Yeah. We're surrounded by guitars here in this studio, and you play guitar? Um, I did. I'm a you, you did? recovering guitar player. <laughs> um, you had a Sears guitar? Was that a silver tone guitar? I, that was the first guitar I had. Yeah. I, I don't remember if I got the guitar before my father passed on or after. But I wanted a guitar, and so I got a Sears Silvertone, and I don't know. That it's, was it's the, probably worth a gazillion dollars. The beginning today. of the end. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I graduated to a Gibson, and you know. That's great. That's great. Yeah, as 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 we want. It's it's just so odd that the guitars that we used to laugh at in our youth are now like vintage guitars worth a gazillion dollars. Right. You know. Right. But one of the first guests we had on our show uh, was Peter Asher, mm. and I understand that Peter Asher was an influence on on your desire to go into the studio. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. You know, I really admired um, Peter for his ability to be a record producer, but also manage the artists that he worked with. And I thought, well, how interesting that would be to make a record with somebody and then have some control over their career so that you can make the most out of the opportunities presented to you to advance the artist's career instead of just delivering the record to a record company and hoping for the best. And I don't know, I've always been a very right brain, left brain person. So his way of working and his clientele really kind of appealed to me in something that I thought I might want to do. I never really thought I would be a career recording engineer, but I thought I should learn something about recording engineering in order to advance the kind of producer-manager part. That ended up coming way, way later, and uh, you know, I was an engineer for a lot of years. So you came up in the days of the two-inch tape, was it two-inch mm-hmm. and mic placements? And so many basic things. There's just certain recording basics, as I understand, that you have to master. You have to understand what the purpose of it is or right. what the instruments actually do. So so you began your career on the recording side here in Los Angeles after doing live sound, I understand, too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In fact, I just saw somebody today who um, was uh, friends with a band that I did live sound with. You know, it's amazing what happens after you get to a certain point in your career that, you know, people just come up to you that you knew in this other part of your, your life. Well, speaking of, of, of other parts, of life, when you were at ABC, I, I know you, you did recording at ABC, but you also had other, did you do other functions with ABC well? As well, I started out in the record company, mm-hmm. in the publicity department. Right. And then they started a division called Artist Relations where you would actually interface with the artists and kind of, help them kind of uh, make their way through the maze of promotion and publicity and all of that when they had a new uh, release. But ABC had a recording studio. So I was working for the record company when I, you know, walked over and and asked for um, a job. I saw a familiar name in your early credits, and that was John Mayall, Mm -hmm. who we know is the father of English blues and uh, still working, still (laughs) out there recording. He's uh, He's on another label now, but he's still doing record. In fact, he just did a record, hmm. John. Yeah. Well, he's good always for him. There. Yeah, right? You know, so did he select you to like work with him or? Was I was uh, an assistant engineer on a record he was doing at ABC with another engineer. And then he came in to do his next record. And my boss told me that he had asked me to be the engineer. Yeah, and and so I, I at some point I asked him why, and the um, other engineer was a wonderful engineer. I had done several projects with him as the assistant. Always came in very neatly dressed, and you know all of that. And John said he liked the fact that I was down on my hands and knees tweaking the tape machine. You know that I wasn't afraid to get my hands dirty and he really liked that. And so he asked me to engineer his next next record. And that was really the first album I had done from start to finish. If you had told me that I my first record would have been a John Mayall, you know, blues or rock record, I would have told you you were crazy because that just wasn't the music that I gravitated towards. But right. anyway, it was a fantastic 
experience, you know. And San Francisco was a stop on the way, and that was at Automat Recording, is that John right? Mayall was at ABC Studios. At ABC, right. 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 Yeah. Okay. And then how long were you at ABC before you moved to San Francisco? I was there for about three or four years. Mm-hmm. 1978, I got the job at the Automat in San Francisco right. and uh, moved up there. We note among your credits, and in fact, in fact, looking at your credits made me want to lie down and take a nap for a while because your credit there's there's a lot to go through, <laughs> but there's certain there's certain things that come up that I think are really interesting for our listeners, and and one is your involvement in women's music with artists like Chris Williamson, mm-hmm. yeah, um, among Farron, among other among uh-huh. other people, right? You know? Holly Near, yeah, yeah, Holly Near, you know, yeah, that was that was its time. That was a great that was a great time when that when that took root. Yeah, it was a. Fantastic time, and we were all very lucky that David Rubinson, who owned the Automat, was very supportive of uh, independent uh, artists and um, women's music, and uh, really, uh, it was a a great time, I think, for all of us, because I think the uh, women's music community was sort of looking to raise the bar on their own recordings, and because I had had quite a bit of mainstream experience. Um, I had no, although I had worked with a lot of women, I had had no women's music experience. And for people that don't really, they hear that now and they go, well, what the heck is that? Well, you know, at that time in the early 80s, record companies were all run by men. Mm -hmm. All the engineers were men. All the producers were men. All the promoters, all the booking agents. It was really a very male-controlled industry. And there was a certain group of women that really wanted to have control over their own careers. So they started their own labels. They made a conscious effort to work just with women. Um, Then there were women booking agents, women promoters, women distributors, labels. Um, And so it, it happened at a very good time for us both because I could experience what that was like to work on projects with, um, only women, uh, and lend my expertise to that, and they were able to um, experience what I had to offer um, as well. So it, it, it was great. It was a, a wonderful part of my career. And I understand that there were other women on staff uh, at the Automat as well, the, the engineers as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very interesting because for a time we had a staff of six engineers, three were women and three were men. As you do when you're on staff at any studio, you go back and forth between being an assistant engineer and sitting in the big chair, as I like to call it. But we would just sort of, you know, work in whatever capacity was uh, required of us. But yeah, I've never been in a situation like that since where there was a 50-50. San Francisco is such an interesting musical town. It's so important uh, in American music. And its influence sometimes seems to kind of come and go with with different generational times. And I've never been quite clear why that is, you know, because it's a great town full of great musicians. Mm -hmm. I guess sometimes just, you know, the musical infrastructure is, is not really like what it is here in Los Angeles, clearly. Yeah. But, you know. But, I mean, you know, even in L.A., things change. Studios Truly. are closing down and starting up all the time. You True. Know, I think um, life just changes. You know, it's mm-hmm. as much as I like to hold on to, you know, what I knew and when what I love. You know, I walked into Oakland Airport today, and they're changing all the food stuff. And it's like, where's my favorite omelet? What the <laughs> hell's going on, you know? <laughs> Well, I, th- I think the, the ability to weather change is a huge part of, of your career as well. I mean, you've worked in so many different technologies yeah. with different kinds of situations. So. Well, de- definitely anyone that has my job, you you have to be able to weather that kind of change because uh, technology in the years I've been doing this has changed drastically. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I kind of embrace some of it kicking and screaming. But I've always tried to hold on to, I don't know, the lessons that I learned early on, the things that make me feel comfortable and the things that really uh, allow me the freedom to do the kind of work that I do. And I try not to change that and just adopt whatever technology is required to do that work. You know, the human factor is a huge part of it too, Leslie Ann Jones. I mean, 
just engaging with you in conversation today. I'm, I'm aware of that. And, you know, having interviewed uh, amazing engineers like Ed Cherney, who we mentioned before, Al Schmidt, um, they are also, they also have a human element that allows them, I believe, to communicate with artists across a really wide parameter. Yeah. Is, it, is that part of your magic? I don't know if it's part of my magic, but I really, um, well, I think you have to like people. Yeah. And I know this about Al because Al talks a lot about going out to talk to the musicians mm -hmm. and making sure he puts the mic where they're comfortable so they're not knocking into it or it's not impeding them. I think you have to respect the people that you work with. I think that comes from me from growing up in the business and seeing the great talent that my parents both work with and and knowing that you had to be a great trombonist because you might have to play Flight of the Bumblebee and be on a trapeze at the same time. You know, not everybody can do that. But I grew up respecting musicians. Uh, so I, I think that that's um, a lot of that. And I don't know if that's magic, but that's just how I do it. You know, I have uh, respect for the artists that I, I work with. I can't do what they're doing, which is why I do what I do. And so I, I try to never forget that, you know. They're the ones with the, the talent and the money and have mortgaged their houses in some cases to be in the studio sure. and, of course, they record their first record. And so I try to take everybody seriously, whether they're already a big star or whether they're just starting out. Amongst your credits are, uh, you know, Kronos Quartet. I mean, you have things that are very acoustically based as mm -hmm. well. And, and I, I enjoy seeing seeing that, which is, you know, very much in the moment of recording as opposed to being in the box or being an electronic yeah. thing. You know, so it's very atmospheric, I would understand. Yeah, and I, I actually, that's pretty much what I do. Yeah. Uh, I kind of do everybody playing at the same time in the same room. I prefer those kinds of records. I think it would be, just for me, somewhat tedious to have to put a record together that has people playing in different parts of the world and adding their parts without the benefit of the interplay. Mm -hmm. Lots of great records get made like that. Mm -hmm. Those are just not the records that I work on. You know, I just, I do records where everybody's kind of playing at the same time and, and I can balance everything at the same time and get an idea of what it's supposed to sound like and not wait until the end to try and put the record together. You yeah, know? yeah. You return to Los Angeles triumphantly, uh, to Capitol. Uh -huh, ah, yeah. there you were at Capitol. What a great room. Talk about great rooms. Oh, yeah. Oh. It was a, a fantastic experience, especially to come to Capitol when Studio A, which was the, you know, Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra room, was going through its metamorphosis into what it is now, mm -hmm. taking something that had a postage stamp sized control room with knobs and a couple of meters and uh, turning it into, uh, you know, Studio A, the great uh, room that it is is now. And that, that also, I think, afforded all of us working at Capitol to start working on different kinds of music because that was kind of the heyday of live television music. And there were only a couple of rooms in town that could do medium-sized bands. And a lot of them, the musicians didn't like. And so when we... Capitol redid this room. Uh, it was fantastic. The players loved playing at it, and that's when I first, you know, I had done a, a of course, I had done Apocalypse Now at the Automat, yeah. but that was not your traditional movie score. So when I was at Capitol and they redid Studio A, I got a chance to start doing a lot of small film work, TV work, and it really opened the doors for um, all of us that were on staff at, at Capitol, kind of, kind of spread our wings and do do more. Did you study film music, or how did you how did you become appropriately educated in what that was? Um, well, yes and no. I don't like to embarrass myself. It is really what it comes down to. I like to uh, have some semblance of knowing what I'm talking about and being able to communicate with the people that I'm working with. So, even when I was starting out, you know, I used hi-fi and stereo magazines to teach mm -hmm. me. Uh, a glossary of of um, definitions for applicable terms 
that would be the same for recording equipment, uh, compression, signal to noise, all of that kind of stuff, so that I could have some idea of what I was talking about. Well, it was the same thing with um, film music. You know, there was just clients would come in and they would have this whole different vocabulary that I didn't really understand what it meant. And um, was a wonderful uh, sound effects editor, Victoria Sampson, who was teaching a class at UCLA on sort of film sound A to Z. And I saw that and I thought, okay, I'm going to take that class. And, uh, and it was a, a really fantastic class from the beginning of uh, pre-production and spotting sessions to um, production sound, you know, recording on the set, to Foley, to sound design, which is not at all even, in fact, what it is now. Sound design was, I think the term was created, of course, in the first Star Wars movie. But um, through scoring, ADR, through the final mix. So in one course, I got the whole perspective of uh, film sound, and then I understood what the terminology was when people came in to do a score, and I could kind of speak their language. I felt like I could be much more effective as a collaborator in the studio, whether I was the assistant or the engineer, because I didn't have to say or wonder what something meant. That was also the period of time where digital was first becoming popular. We had to learn how to sync analog and digital and uh, do offsets on uh, tape machines, and it was just a whole different world. I was really grateful I, I could take that, that class. Oh, classes. So, so it's a little learning curve, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And I would imagine that, that when Pro Tools became, you know, de rigueur, that was, that was another type of learning, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I've, I've worked with engineers who, <clears throat> who grew up on Pro Tools, who that was their basis, as yeah. opposed to people that had to learn it later. Just right. like anything else, you learn it later. Sometimes it's a little bit more learning needs to happen. Well, you know, when I started using digital machines, it was back at the Automat. Uh, I did the first digital multitrack session in San Francisco with a, a 3M, and we did a Carlos Santana record, The Swing of Delight, on that. And uh, But at that point, and even through many years after that, those machines were really just recorders. They were digital versions of um, analog tape machines. Even on the film side, when they had an, what was called an MMR8, which was an eight-track version of a mag uh, mm-hmm. machine. So it really wasn't until uh, Pro Tools came out that you had the advantage of having a recorder and an editor at the same time. I continued to work on analog mm-hmm. at um, Skywalker we rented Pro Tools because most people were still doing analog. So we actually, at least on the music side, we didn't own any. What we ended up buying was a machine uh, called a Euphonics R1 because the you could get more tracks at a higher sampling rate. And I was always interested in high-resolution recording and um, getting the best sound possible. And with Pro Tools, they, you know, I would think it was... 20, 20, 24-bit 48K for 32 tracks, and you could get 48 tracks on an R1 at 24.96. No editing capabilities, but, mm-hmm. you know, still. Um, and, and then eventually it was a transition to uh, Pro Tools and doing more editing and kind of embracing that as, you know, what was new, and, and that was that. Yeah. 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 What, what, was, what was the transition from Capital to Skywalker? Um, how, how did you make that transition, and what was kind of the impetus to do that move? Well, I'd always wanted to come back to the Bay Area. Yeah. I bought a house when I worked at the Automat, and um, always wanted to come back. But, you know, it's you know hard. Uh, I, I've never wanted to be an independent um, engineer. I've always enjoyed being on staff. Uh, Skywalker was the kind of place that, that was very hard to get into because it's um, project-based. So most of the employees are hired by the project. They're not hired to be on staff. I worked at Capital for nine years and had done a lot of dates and worked with a lot of great people. I was just, you know, feeling like it was maybe time to 
move uh, move on. And you know, uh, Gloria Borders, who was running Skywalker at the time, um, there was a story about her in Mix Magazine, and she had talked about the fact that her next challenge was getting the scoring stage to kind of live up to its potential. And so I called some friends of mine that worked at Skywalker, and they said, yeah, she was serious. So I called and got an interview, and I was hired. It's funny, too, because I I don't think I was hired as a mixer. I, I She was hiring me because of my film contacts mm-hmm. and being able to run the scoring stage and, and kind of uh, parlay some of my contacts into more work and... So it really was, I was there for, a, I think, a year before I actually stepped foot in the studio and did um, a project. So, yeah, it was, it, it was great. It's interesting we talk about the technology. I remember when the music to video games was bleeps and bloops. And I think I blinked or I turned my head for a second. And when I came back to consciousness, it was like composers going to Russia and having full orchestras. Yeah. So it's interesting how the video games, you know, sonically have just expanded into really into into films, mm-hmm. you know. And I know you work on a lot. You work on video I games do. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really um, enjoy them a lot. It's a very collaborative experience. Music departments of the video game companies. Most of the people that are involved in those departments are composers themselves, or have been composers. So they really have a a uh, really good working knowledge of orchestras, and and they work hand in hand with the composers, uh, and then they come into Skywalker, and we get an orchestra the same size as we would have on a, a feature film, and the scores are very have become very cinematic because that's what the audience uh, expects. Yeah. They want something larger than life, and of course, the graphics have also improved greatly in um, video games. I saw a couple of cuts um, during the um, Tech Awards uh, mm-hmm. when they were giving out uh, some of the awards, and there was some footage of some video games, and you would swear you were looking at, you know, live action. It's really quite um, amazing. So there are a lot of fun for for me, and for our staff as well. You know, everybody's really happy to be there. There's not the same kind of pressure that there is on a film score where the stakes are much higher and, the, you know, there's a million producers in the room and, you know, the composer and the director says, you know, I didn't hear that before. And, you know, so uh, it's, uh, it's much more comfortable. We have fun and, and uh, I really enjoy it. Do you play games? Do you play I don't. games? No, but I don't think... Uh, for what I do, it's yeah. a requirement, really. Exactly. I think as long as I know how to mic an orchestra and get the best sound that I can and talk to the composer about what sound it is they want, and I can kind of translate that into the sound that comes out of the speakers, then it really doesn't matter whether I play games or not. You know, sure. All that is done between the composer and the audio team and the uh, director of the game. So, yeah. Good. Good. Um, this is a kind of a good news, bad news uh, situation. Here at Stereophonic, we're, both, we're all real positive people. So we, what we see are, are good things. You know what I mean? You can look at the world in many different ways. Right. And one of the good things that... That's a good, uh, that's a good attitude to have these days. I think so, yeah. uh, especially these days. Yeah. But one of the great things that we see is the Recording Academy's Task Force on Diversity and Inclusion mm-hmm. and a new initiative that they have announced which is going to be to expand opportunities for female producers and engineers. Right. And we think that's terrific. Yeah, it is. You know? Yeah, it's really, really great. It's, uh, you know, about time that there are groups taking that uh, seriously. And it doesn't happen without making a big effort. Sure. And, um, and so I'm, I'm really pleased that the Recording Academy has taken that that step. Uh-huh. It's been interesting when I've interviewed songwriter producers, um, some of whom have shared with me that they have done production on projects, even though they're primarily songwriters, but they still, they, they fulfill production mm-hmm. roles, but they are denied that credit. And invariably those have been women that have told me that in interviewing them. 
or that they've had to fight for a production credit. I, I find this this news of things increasing and getting better to be a, to be a real good thing. Yeah. So whether it's Linda Perry uh, producing or, you know, different folks, you know, it's time. It is. And, and I'm not... Um... I'm not sure how much of that, of what you speak about mm-hmm. in terms of the crediting, mm-hmm. is um, a gender thing. Uh, I, I think mm. the whole way credits are done now in the modern music business, in the contemporary music business, is really so much different because the roles of the participants are so varied now. Some people are getting producer credit because they wrote the beats and it's in their contract. Yeah. That if you write if you write the beat, you might not write the melody, you might not write the lyrics, you might not show up to any recording session, but it's in your contract that if you use my beats, I'm listed as a producer. Yeah. yeah. And um, that's just whacked as far as I'm concerned, you know, because when you grow up like I did and you know what a producer does in terms of being responsible for a majority of the project and hiring the players and overseeing everything and having creative input, that's um, a little hard. And, and yet, having said that, I think the gender part comes from sometimes we women just want to participate so much and want to collaborate so much that we're not willing to even have a contract, mm. let alone have a contract that says, if I do this, you're going to credit me with this. So in that respect, it is a gender thing, but I can tell you that in my experience, women are less likely to ask for the credits that they deserve because we ju- we so want to work, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, I know they're... One of the first big records I did was an Angela Bofield record, and I engineered and mixed the whole thing, and the hairdresser got a credit, and I didn't, you know? <laughs> well, I didn't have it in my, in my contract, and unfortunately, the producer yeah. had no say, really. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just, I think that as time goes on, we need to be more adamant about what we do contribute and owning that credit and taking it, uh, which doesn't mean we can still can't have fun collaborating. And I, you know, I, 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 you know, if you and Lindsay get a lot of mail about that, so be it. <laughs> Forward it to me. I'm happy to answer it. But I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. You know, and I've sort of seen the evolution of that and the change in the music business, where the roles are not nearly as defined um, as they were, and. Since it's so ambiguous, I think it's even more important that because we women like to collaborate and just want to do the job, that we uh, make sure that we get the credit that we deserve. Amen. But you're right, the collaborative nature, especially in pop music now, where we have six or eight writers on a song, uh, you know, a number of producers, oi... Uh, and then there's there's one of the writers might be the vibe person. They pro- they just provide the vibe. I yeah. don't know what that means. They bring no, something. No, and to the now party. you've got somebody that plays bass who, because it's the important part yeah, of the exactly. tune, they want writer's Writer credit, credit. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. imagine if the cats that played on the Motown records, you know, wanted credit. I mean, you and I could sing the bass parts yes. for those records. Yes. Yes. You no. Know, true. I true. Don't. Which is not to say they probably shouldn't have got credit, but you yeah. Know. Well, you mentioned the Wrecking Crew. I mean, some you know they they came up with head parts. Glenn Campbell came up with guitar intros totally. and head parts that were that they're they're so indicative of of the song. So, but yeah, I, I love your point of reference though. The fact that you know you use knowledge and you use your length of time around the business to move to move forward, not to stay put, just yeah. to move forward, but actually with points of reference that, that you recognize from the past. Right. Nothing more beautiful than a fabulous singer and an amazing microphone, though. That is true. It never changes. Yeah. It never changes. Let's do, some, um, let's do some nerd questions now, some, some tech nerd questions for our listeners who are, who are tech people. Um, and I understand uh, one of your at, at the, it's the Neve board that mm-hmm. you have, and yeah, we have a Neve uh, um, AMS Neve eighty uh, eight R. Yes, yes, and is that your baby? It is. Yeah, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I've always worked on Neves. You know, it's just happened. Oh, at least, you know, at uh, the Automat, uh, I worked on Harrison, and we had a Trident uh, at ABC. We had custom consoles. Frank Dominio, who was a very influential console designer, uh, did all the consoles at uh, ABC. Uh, but at uh, Capital, uh, we had uh, Neves, and then at um, Skywalker, we're, we're on our third. Any special compressors that you like or that you use? or No, uh, nothing particularly special. I tend to change up depending on, you know, kind of what's what's needed. Everything has its own sound and and offers its own personality to, to things. So um, there's, you know, probably nothing I couldn't live without other than maybe my Lexicon 224, which I've had for years. In fact, there's a picture of me at the Automat and the <laughs> remote is sitting next to the 24-track um, remote. So I've been using that for a long time. We have two at Skywalker, and, and um, that, that's probably it. Always intrigued by the microphones, by, by especially for vocal mics mm -hmm. that people choose to use, and I would imagine you have an, a, quite an arsenal of those. Yeah, we have a you know we have a a wonderful toolbox that we can pick from for all different kinds of of uh, projects. You know, the usual Neumanns and AKGs and two fifty one and think you know things things like that mm -hmm. that. Um, a studio like ours or any of the bigger rooms would would uh, have. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll put up two or three mics with uh, somebody who I haven't worked with before and just have them sing into all three mics and see which mic fits best for their voice on that particular song. And you might hear an, uh, a mic that you're not choosing for that song that might be the right choice for some other song. You know, it really all um, depends. Is that just an intuition thing that you just you just know it's right? Well, if I knew it was right, I'd pick one mic and we'd be done. <laughs> no, I I just uh, <laughs> no, um, I, I just I know what I want to hear, uh -huh. and I also know, you know, everybody's voice is different. Women's voices are different than men's voices. The same mic for a woman might not be the right mic choice for. A guy. It also depends on the type of music, of course. If it's if you're doing classical opera singing, or if it's a pop or jazz vocal, uh, what the dynamics are, how much sibilance the singer has. Um, so there are so many variables, uh, which is why you know we're we're lucky we have a lot of tools that we can pick from, and fortunately, there's usually one of those three that that will will work. Yeah. You know, back in, in the in the day, you know, a whole lot of time was spent on the drum sound, and and I remember reading stories of days spent getting specific drum sounds. I mean, has that has that tightened up now? Have those processes become simpler, or has it has it has the dynamic of that changed? Well, you know, I don't work on rock records, so it right. might uh, it might be that that is still the same. I would say I'm very lucky to work in a really great sounding room with great equipment. Uh, a lot of players come in with wonderful sounding drums. I have my own snare drum that sometimes we'll use if the uh, snare that the drummer comes in with doesn't quite quite fit. Um, not that I'm a drummer, but I have a great snare drum it's to me it's just like having um another tool i remember in the in the you know old days when you had drummers come in and their car guys came in and tuned the kit and were there before the start of the session and you know change the heads and you know uh bottom heads no bottom heads you know that was a, a, a luxury in those days where you seem to have endless hours in the studio to get um a drum sound yeah. I think there were endless budgets in those days to get the drum sound. That's what I mean. That's part of the process of yeah. of that change as yeah. well. But I think part of it too is you know again it's kind of knowing what you want to hear. My father was a drummer. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been around drums my whole life, so I have an idea of kind of how drums fit in with the rhythm section and what the tonality needs to be, how they need to sort of speak. 
And it's not just about the microphones that you put up. If it doesn't start with a good drum kit and a good drummer, then there's nothing I can really do about it, you know? So uh, a lot of that is on the uh, player and the rest of the band, which is why I have my own snare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here, try this. Try. <laughs> Will, Will Kennedy, who's a fantastic drummer, uh, gave me that snare. Neat. Just, yeah. When you came in, we were talking about a composer named Laura Carpman, yeah. who we know kind of know collectively in, right. in different ways. And uh, you did a project with her a couple years ago. Yeah, I believe you got a Grammy for the project, yes. right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we did a fantastic project called Ask Your Mama. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really one of the first projects I think I've done where I was involved from the very beginning, from the inception of the project. It was um, the uh, w- words were by uh, Langston Hughes. Right. And um, <clears throat> Langston Hughes wrote a book called Ask Your Mama. And in the sidebar, a kind of of the book are his notes about the type of music that he heard in those sections. And uh, Laura just did a fantastic job of taking those notes and kind of uh, extrapolating those into a a fantastic score, Um, very multimedia with Langston's voice, uh, other voices uh, that she would play through uh, Ableton, and uh, Jesse Norman was involved, uh, a couple of guys from the Roots mm-hmm. were um, involved, and we workshopped at uh, University of Michigan, I believe, and then we uh, went to um, uh, Carnegie. Yeah, and so I was, I guess, I guess Laura would say I was the sound designer on it in terms of really taking her vision of all these different things and trying to figure out how that would get to the audience in a way that they could understand what was going on. So I not only mixed the sound in the venues we were in, but I also really, I think, you know, helped her um, in envision how that would uh, work. And it was just a fantastic experience. So we did it at Carnegie, and then we did it at the Hollywood Bowl. And uh, she was able to raise enough money to come up to Skywalker, and we worked with the San Francisco Ballet Orchestra and did it there. And then she uh, worked with uh, Judy Sherman, who's a fantastic classical producer. Judy does most of Kronos Quartet's work, and I've known Judy for years. And so Judy produced the final thing, and uh, John Kilgore in New York uh, mixed it. So, And uh, Laura's wife, Nora, also did some of the overdubbing and so there were a number of us who you know uh, shared in the uh, grammy award for best engineered um, recording and it was really i think i said it in my speech when we accepted the award that it was seven years in in the making from from when laura first called me about working on the project to standing uh, on that stage and uh it was you know it's the it's the great thing about the grammy speaking of grammy week you can have a project like that. Who heard it? Nobody, unless you were at Carnegie or unless you were at the Hollywood Bowl. And then there's this record. But, you know, uh, quality really matters, you know. It was fantastic that people recognized the great work that that recording had. And uh, I love working with Laura. She's, um, uh, you know, she always has the most outlandish ideas. But she's just one of those people that I just raise my hand and say, whatever, you know, just call me. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, if if I don't know how to do it, I figure it out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But quality matters. I mean, I think yeah. that's, I guess, the distillation of, of right. that's, those are the three words, right? Or the yeah. two words there that just yeah. kind of grab it. Well, it's funny because you know? there's a recording academy initiative that the producers and engineers wing has called Quality Sound Matters. And I co-chair the committee of that with uh, Phil Wagner. And uh, we're always working on how to uh, promote uh, quality sound and how to get the consumer to understand that quality sound does matter in their enjoyment of the music that they hear. Great, great. So you're involved in a couple other, I mean, advocacy. You're involved in advocacy. 
um, as well. And uh, there's an organization, I believe, that you're working with uh, in addition to bring more women into the business in terms of education? Well, I do. um, Every year I go to Massachusetts and teach at a a performance camp called Institute for the Musical Arts. It's run by June Millington, who is the co-founder of the seminal all-female band Fanny, Mm -hmm. and her partner, Ann Hackler, uh, IMA started in the Bay Area in Bodega Bay, and then eventually they moved to this kind of big, you know, sort of farm in uh, western Massachusetts. And they have a performance space and uh, a small recording studio that uh, John Stork uh, designed. And uh, so they have several performance camps for girls and young women. They have a preteen camp, you know, so girls come and learn how to write songs. They take kind of master classes in drums and guitar and things like that. And then they added a recording track many years ago. So I teach the first half. And Roma Barron, who's an Mm -hmm. engineer from New York, and Leanne Unger, Mm -hmm. who um, is an engineer and also an instructor at uh, Berkeley College of Music, they do the second half. So I teach the kind of basics, and and then uh, they play cleanup. <laughs> it sounds great. Yeah, Leanne. Leanne was certainly somebody we're aware of. Yeah. Uh, as as a producer. Yeah. I know her work, so that's that's really neat. Yeah. yeah. So I um yeah. I do that uh, each year. Cool. And it's uh, it's it's really fun. You know, I start on a Friday night. And by Tuesday, the girls are recording themselves. And I go, you know, it's like it, it's this thing about this initiative that these young women have, you know. They really are pretty fearless. And it's just really kind of showing them their way around the technology and trying to uh, open their ears to what different things sound like and kind of how to choose different microphones and you know, just it's it's a very accelerated thing. I don't expect any of them to be engineers, but I do want them as, and I'm sure June and Ann share this, as, you know, to be, uh, to not let their lack of knowledge of technology stand in their way from recording themselves and get doing their own demos and, you know, making choices about things, you know? Yeah. And they stand on the shoulders of greatness. They stand on the shoulders of June Mellington. They stand on the shoulders of you or... You know, Chris Williamson, the people that came before, Ganyar yeah. Ganyar Raven, Goldie and the Gingerbreads. It goes right. Ganyar Raven, man, <laughs> more power to you. I have not heard that in a long time. <laughs> she was one of the first female producers I was oh, yeah. in New York. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. In fact, the all female band I was in, we used to do her her stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. she's she's great. She's great. That's why I get the big bucks. Oh, I saw. <laughs> <laughs> We love women. Yeah. We love women. You know, this is a very women. We're all girls here. We're all, we're all here. We're all... Um, is there an artist that you have not recorded, a vocalist perhaps, that you would like to work with? Um, well, yeah. It's, it's kind of funny because I get asked that question a lot, and I tend to name some of the same people. And I keep forgetting to add this woman to my list, but Lisa Fisher is, uh, I I saw her perform, and I've seen her perform many times. I have had the opportunity to work with her on something totally unrelated to her own work. It was for um, Alonzo King's ballet company in San Francisco, where she and her musical director wrote uh, a piece of music for the ballet company, and they came to Skywalker to um, record what they did so that when the ballet company goes on the road, they have the music to do, and Lisa doesn't have to show up all the time. And the minute I heard she was doing something, I had seen her perform once before, and I called up the production manager of the ballet company because we've done other work with them before, and I said, um, you are coming to Skywalker, aren't you? And so they they came. It was the, one of the most enjoyable experiences I've had, and I would really love to do a whole record with her. She is just so incredibly um, talented. And uh, yeah, so she's kind of tops on my list. Now there are, you know, 
lots of other people. Sure. I'd love to work with uh, Roseanne Cash. Mm-hmm. I'd love to work with her husband, John Leventhal, who's a fantastic producer and um, guitarist. Um, yeah, that's good. The list is endless. Uh, yeah, point. well, those those are some good people. I mean, John Leventhal, so, you know, his arrangements are always really interesting. Yeah. So, much, so much air in, in what he does. Yeah. It's always been really interesting how much around is around it. Um, you came to music very early on. You were destined to do the music track. Did you ever in your darkest moments think that there was another kind of thing that you could have done or that you would have done? Or is there anything else that your personality or your interests would have taken you to? Well, uh, I ended up being a winemaker. Uh, that certainly wasn't like in my darkest days when I was failing as an engineer. <laughs> no. I decided I had to look for something else. Uh, but no, I, I, I've i been very lucky in my career because I've never, I've always, you know, found like, you know, another door opened. Yeah. Uh, and not because it didn't have some help from me wanting it, but it was really about kind of recognizing opportunities that were there and what how I could make the best of those uh, opportunities. So I've been very lucky in that I my level of despair has been pretty minor. Um, and so so no, there wasn't really anything that uh, I wanted to do that um, I didn't do. And, I, and but I, I should say also that I've always been very happy where I was. Mm-hmm. When I was an assistant, I was never crawling over people to sit in the big chair. I was just trying to be the best assistant engineer I could possibly be, and learn enough so that when the time came for me to be the engineer, that I could sit in the big chair and and do a halfway decent job. Same thing with producing. I wasn't an engineer waiting to be a producer. You know. Yeah. Uh, killing somebody so that I could get their gig, you know. Um, I, I don't think that serves anybody because then you're spending all your time wanting to be somebody else than who you are. And so, you know, eventually I've been able to do everything that I wanted to do, including be, being a winemaker, so. Yeah. Well, one last question, if I may. Similarities between recording music and making wine. What what oh. what are the similarities? Uh, there are a lot, actually. And the consulting winemaker that I, I work with, um, and I should say my wine's not available commercially, right. so don't go looking for it. Um, he, uh, he loves music. And we have the best time when we're doing blending sessions comparing what we're doing to musical sounds. And um, uh, it's really much like orchestration. It's the right balance of things. And it's having an, it's, you know, knowing the range of an oboe so that you're writing for an oboe and not for a soprano saxophone. Um, Knowing that a certain wine that comes from Dry Creek Valley is going to taste different than a wine that comes from the Russian River. So it's, it's, it's very much the, the, the same. You're just working with grapes and taste rather than sound and, and your ears. And it's been uh, just a, a great experience for me because I've been a, a wine sort of snob for years. Uh, David Rubinson, who owned the Automat, uh, introduced me to wine. And um, uh, so it's been fantastic taking all my knowledge for all these years and actually being able to do something with it. Music and wine, yep. e- equally intoxicating. Right. Leslie Ann, thank you so much for being our guest. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's been great to be here. This episode of Storyophonic was produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasek. Our theme music was written by Dusty Gray and is used by permission from Ear Parade Los Angeles. Thanks again for listening and we look forward to having you back for another episode of Storyophonic. <laughs>